You may think um, that what you've heard tonight, Rethinking the Norm, is for extraordinary people because we have seen three extraordinary videos, two amazing speakers. Um, and I want to suggest that Rethinking the Norm is actually quite normal and that it is for normal people like you and me. And I suspect that Alex and Richard, who spoke before me, would also say that they were pretty normal people too. What we've heard tonight are normal people who have done extraordinary things by simply being normal. Rethinking the norm is how we are made. We are all of us programmed that way. If you think about it, our evolution as the human race is one of adapting as the world changes around us. And you couldn't have wished for two better contrasts than listening to Richard about how warfare needs to adapt, and then Travis on the last Uber video in terms of moving from driver, dri cars with drivers to driverless cars. We just evolve as a human race all of the time. Sometimes it happens to us that we have to respond and evolve in a crisis. And there's an inspiring story of six children who lost their parents in 2004 in the Boxing Day tsunami in Sri Lanka. Two of the boys saved each other and their two younger siblings in the swirling seas by thinking differently and better than many of the adults. And once they returned to England, now orphans, two, the two brothers who were aged 17 and 19 founded a business and a charity that raises funds for the children who were made homeless and parentless back in Sri Lanka. And their charity is called Orphans for Orphans. In less traumatic times, it's about being open to opportunity, and we've heard several of those instances tonight. Mind-blowing examples of people just responding to opportunity, thinking about rethinking the norm in ways that perhaps we think we couldn't. But my point is that we can, because it's what humans do all of the time, and we do it in the most normal ways. Let me take it down to a very personal and bed for school level. Whatever you eat, whether you like it or not, what is served to you in the dining halls, I am sure that you like it more than the food that was served to your predecessors here over a hundred years ago. Somewhere in that timeline, the norm of horrible, grisly, fatty school food was rethought, and you are now eating the new norm. And if you think it's time to rethink the norm again, you need to find out when your new catering contract comes up. Or if you take rugby, I remember listening to Sir Clive Woodward, who was the coach who led the England rugby squad to the World Cup victory in 2003. He described passionately how the team had set themselves that goal of winning and then rethought the norm to get there. And yes, of course, they put in hours and hours of grinding training, physical training, that was a given. But what they added to their physical training was physical training for the eyes. They all sat down together in a classroom and using apps that were specially designed on their laptops, they physically trained their eyes. And in the next year's tournaments, competing teams could not match their ball skills because their hand-eye coordination was world-class. They had rethought the norm of training. And then when the others copied and eye training became a norm, they thought again. Rugby shirts. I don't know if you're, you're even old enough to remember when, when my sons played in the prep school, they used to have rugby shirts that were really, really heavy cotton. And whenever they got wet or damp, they were very, very easy to, to grab hold of. What Sir Clive Woodward did with the England rugby team in 2003 is they introduced Lycra shirts. So the shirts were so tight-fitting, it was impossible to grab the shirts when they were being tackled. And it was another thing in terms of rethinking the norm that helped that team win the World Cup victory in 2003. And they remain the only Northern Hemisphere team to have won the World Cup just by rethinking the norm, eye training, and redesigning their shirts. But rethinking the norm doesn't always have a good outcome. Hitler rethought the norm for the German race, and he exterminated six million Jews. In the Yemen today, seven million people are starving because corrupt regimes are rethinking their borders. Yemen is caught in the middle. And as a result of similar sovereign greed in Europe, millions of refugees are homeless. And I heard on the radio just last week, 2,000 boys of your own age are living under plastic sheets on Greek islands, orphans, nobody thinking about them at all. My point is that rethinking the norm is normal, 
and natural for human beings to do. We all of us have the potential to do it. It is innate and it's a gift in every single one of us. And you can do it well and you can create great value or you can do it extraordinarily badly and create evil. And I'd like to think that you will do it well. But how? How do you rethink the norm? First of all, it is not about having brilliant ideas. It's more about an approach to life. And I wrote this before I heard Richard and Alex particularly speak this evening. And they used word, the same words that I've written. I wrote, it is about being curious and about being open to opportunities and being persistent in following them up. And that was what Alex was talking about. He was constantly curious about how he was going to achieve this dream. And he was persistent. He said, don't get hung up at the research stage, keep going. And then at some stage, you turn them into a goal, just like the rugby team did, that is a positive one, and one that helps others as you go. And I want to share with you one of my examples, which is about rethinking the norm of an organization. When I joined the post office 10 years ago, we were closing branches. There had been 30,000 post offices in the UK. Every single community had one. The decade, decade or so before I joined, 15,000 of those had been closed because successive governments couldn't make them pay. And the thinking, I suppose it was rethinking the norm in a sense, was if they closed half the post offices, then the customers would have to go to the other half and they would then be successful. But it still didn't work. And when I joined with 15,000 post offices remaining, my first job was to close another 2,500. And it was really hard. My teams had to go to public meetings in village halls, working men's clubs on remote islands off the coast of Scotland to be bullied and shouted at, treated unpleasantly, even by members of parliament and councillors who should have known better, because in many cases it was their political parties that had decided on the closures. And in the face of such hostility, I and my colleagues still had to close down two and a half thousand post offices. And then even worse, because there were now fewer post offices, many of my colleagues lost their own jobs because it had been their jobs to manage post offices. It was soul destroying. And it didn't really make any sense because nobody wanted the post offices to close. Communities were desperate to keep them open. Online sales were just beginning to take off in the UK and we needed places to pick up and to drop off parcels. Old people still wanted to collect their pensions. Social security payments had to be made to people who had no work. And even today, when pensions and benefit payments are paid direct into bank accounts, there are still two to three million people who live in what is called the cash economy and cannot get bank accounts for whatever reason. Talking about cash, the post office puts 40 billion pounds worth of cash into the UK economy. I run the post offices, but I also run a big cash distribution business. We have armoured vehicles that take cash. 14 pence in every pound in your pocket comes through a post office at some stage or other. We were and we still are the biggest uh, bureau de change, so travel money when you go on holiday, the majority, 25% of people get it from the post office. We were and still are one of the oldest and most trusted savings banks. We check passports, we provide biometric identities nowadays, um, fingerprints, electronic signatures, biometric photo capture, iris recognition, and we sell stamps. <laughs> Post offices are vital to communities, and it did not make any sense to close them at all. And I'll tell you what we did by rethinking the norm for the whole organization in just a moment. But I want to tell you, first of all, about Gladys. Gladys lives in a very rundown area of Manchester, what the politicians call urban deprived. She is poor. Gladys has to manage from week to week on her old age pension of 113 pounds and 10 pence. And I visited the post office that Gladys uses. It is inside a shopping precinct opposite an Asda supermarket. When customers come into the post office, they often bring in their big shopping trolleys with them because if they left them outside, frankly, someone might nick their shopping because it's that kind of place. So as you walk into this post office, particularly with a supermarket shopping trolley, there was a bench on the right-hand side just by the door as you walked in. And I said, I was, I'd just joined the post office, probably been there a year or so, and I was in charge of the branches, and I said to the manager, look, it's fine if customers bring their shopping trolleys in. I completely understand why they would do that, 
but if you just move that bench, they'll have more room. And he looked at me in the way that people look at you, and you know you said something really seriously wrong. And he said, that's Gladys's bench. Gladys has no family, no one to look after her. She lives in one of the roughest streets around that post office, and she comes into our post office every day to eat her lunch on that bench. And you'll be very pleased to know that the bench is still there. That manager was rethinking the norm. His job was to run an efficient post office, but he knew that if he took the bench away, he would lose his chance to keep an eye out for Gladys. And we know from the research that we do that 95% of post offices do that kind of thing all around the country. It's called social and, an, and economic value. And the government has valued it at 4.5 billion pounds. It isn't just caring about people, though, because actually, if you think about it, Gladys coming into that post office every day to eat her lunch keeps Gladys going. It keeps her physically, physically fit. It keeps her mentally fit. But what we do isn't just about that caring side of people. There's a very strong financial edge as well. So, for instance, the post office has helped thousands of new eBay businesses grow because if you're selling products on eBay, you need somewhere to drop off your parcels and for them to be collected. And as they grow, they also bring in work to the post offices and to the adjacent retail shops that the post offices are inside. So all of this comes back to it didn't make any sense to be closing post offices. And despite having tried closing them, the government was still losing, three years ago, £115 million pounds and was subsidising us to the tune of a further £210 million as well. Money that could and should be better used elsewhere. And if you think back to Richard's presentation where he showed those pie charts of how hard they have to fight for money for the armed forces, um, with some of the investment and the turnaround that we've done in the post office, I'm delighted to say that we were doing our bit for the armed forces too. We had, therefore, to become a sustainable commercial business that could make a profit so that we didn't need that government subsidy. But at the same time, I needed us to keep our social purpose that kept an eye on people like Gladys, and also serve the small business communities as well. We were told that it couldn't be done. Commercial businesses can't be owned by government. But it can, because we've rethought the norm. We have kept a post office in every single community that they were in three years ago. And they're in 11,600 places all across the UK. And from losing £115 million three years ago, next year, in fact, in about four or five months' time in our new financial year, we should make a profit of £20 million. And that will be the first time in 15 years that the post office has ever made a profit. And that's really important because we need the money to invest in digital growth, we need the money to invest in technology and in opening new post offices where they were closed previously. So what did we do? <laughs> well, we were curious. We asked questions and we kept asking questions until we found out the right answers. Why didn't enough people use the post offices? The answer was because they weren't open at a time that people needed them. So in the last three years, and actually today <laughs> it's happened, we've just modernised our 7,000th new post office. We put them into new premises alongside convenience stores in most cases, so that they're now open at the same time as the shops are open, from 6 or 7 in the morning till 10 or 11 at night. And it's been the, big, the single biggest contributor to turning around the business. Every time we put a post office in a convenience store, it helps that business. People come in and they spend money on the retail side as well as in the post office. Why else didn't they use post offices? Because in the big ones, frankly, the queues were just too long. So we put in self-service kiosks. And this is also another example of rethinking the norm. Because if you put a self-service kiosk in a post office, where your staff have only ever worked behind a counter and in many cases behind a glass uh, screen as well, they really don't want to go out onto the shop floor and help people understand how to use self-service kiosks. So we had to rethink about their training. Um, and now, 50 to 70% of the customers coming in where we've got these kiosks in the big places, Milton Keynes is probably the nearest to here, prefer to use the self-service. We also asked how we could make more money by providing new or better services that communities needed. And here, I actually spotted an opportunity that wasn't very obvious at the time. 
About two years ago, I read in the, uh, the, the Times, I think it was, that Barclays Bank were closing 400 branches. And in the article it said, you know, we're really sorry we're closing 400 branches in these communities, but actually you don't need to worry because you can go to your local post office and you can do most of your banking there. And then I thought, well, actually, so they're closing banks because the business they do through the banks is costing them too much money, they're losing money on a lot of it, and actually what they're doing is they're sending me all the business they don't want because it just costs them money. So for the last 18 months, we've been negotiating a, what's called a framework agreement with all of the banks in the UK, or at least the 20 biggest ones. Uh, and again, coincidentally today, we announced it in the press. There's a very good article in the Financial Times if you're interested. So you can now do all of your local banking at your local post office. What that means is that it brings in more business to the local post offices, and it's very convenient for the customers and the communities too. Um, and what we've done with the banks is we've said, we'll do that with you provided you actually pay us to do it. Um, so the banks have now paid us uh, a fee of several million pounds to, to take on that additional business that they didn't, work, they didn't want. So, I mean, I could give you many, many more examples. What we've done is we've just rethought the norm around almost everything that we did within the post office, even down to the way we work. So we used to work in a building that was on five floors, full of offices, quite dark and dingy, long corridors, no food facilities in the offices at all. And we've moved into one which is on two wide open floors, um, and we work around tables and desks. So none of us has offices. I work around a table just alongside other people. Uh, we've got a great Costa coffee place down on the ground floor and a hot food kitchen. Uh, and we are also, all of us, equipped with portable devices so that we can work from anywhere. Um, and I actively encourage colleagues to do that. So we will work from home. I usually work from home a day a week, a day a fortnight. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you work from if you've actually got the technology to do it. People have got much more interesting jobs. They've been given more responsibility. Um, and in the new offices we're in, we're just much happier because it's just such a nicer place to be. What else do we do? We've committed that we will all go and work in a post office because how can you be in a management team or a leadership team that runs post offices if you don't know what it's like working in one? So all of the 2,000 people who work in the head office and post office, every Christmas, because it's the busiest time, we all go and work out in post offices and we come back with hundreds of ideas about how to improve things. When we started on the turnaround of the post office, we asked ourselves, and this would have been, I suppose, when I joined, so I joined 10 years ago, so this would have been about eight, seven or eight years ago. We asked ourselves what would success look like, and you got to think back to that time where there were queues in every single post office, they were standalone places, they were quite dark and dingy, a bit like the office we worked in, um, and, and like there were lots of strikes going on, life was pretty hard. And somebody said in this room, well, it would be fantastic if, you know, success would look like if your son or your daughter actually wanted to come and work for the post office. And at the time, we all went, yeah, 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 right, you know, this, this is a place where people in their 50s work, and why would anybody under the age of 30 ever want to come near a post office? Um, and now we have one of the best graduate schemes in the country. We are oversubscribed. We take talented young people. I was with one yesterday, a Cambridge graduate who's been with us two years, actually talking to her about what her first management job will be. And what we do is we accelerate people. If we think they're good, we give them responsibility. Um, and interestingly, or ironically, my own son, Luke, um, who's in his final year at Bristol University, is looking for his first job. And we have a brilliant scheme, and I'm so pleased that he could apply for it. But <laughs> he can't really work where his mum is chief executive, can he? So he won't. <laughs> um, but it's just an amazing achievement to be in a place where no longer are we worried that we can attract the, the right people to the company. Um, and we've also taken on diversity challenges. So if you get the chance to Google Alex Clark, skier, Clark with an E, when you get a moment, Alex is a very normal guy. He's one of our graduates, joined us three years ago, and he's on the UK Paralympic ski team. Alex is normal, but he's amazing. He's determined. He rethinks the norm every day of his life. He has cerebral palsy, and he was told about seven or eight years ago that he would never walk again. We now give him time off work to go and train and race for the UK uh, Paralympic team. It just makes people rethink the post office, and it gives Alex so much confidence and commitment in his day job. 
and lastly from young graduates to young soldiers. In World War I, the post office had its own regiment, the post office rifles. 70,000 men in total left their jobs in the post office to fight for king and country, and about 30% of those never came back. At the time, rethinking the norm, the post office then employed 55,000 women to run the business while, whilst all the men were away on the front line. The post office has been around in one guise or another for about 400 years, and it's an organisation that is organic. It evolves as society and the world around it has evolved, and we have rethought the norm time and time again. For me, it's a privilege to be the person who's leading the most recent turnaround. But my point in all of this is that we are all of us part of a continuum of humanity rethinking the norm. It is something that we all do in greater and lesser ways all of our lives. You have the chance today and for the rest of your life, so take it. It's very easy. Listen to what Alex said. Be curious, be persistent, and when you do it, do it for the greater good. Thank you for listening.